Hello, we are here at uh, Republica in a session called Ask Everything, Ask Me Everything. Uh -huh. And uh, we have here um, Cory Doctorow. Uh -huh. And uh, would you please first present yourself in, in just a few uh, sure. words? Yeah, I'm Cory Doctorow. I'm an activist and a journalist and a science fiction novelist. I'm a visiting professor of computer science at the Open University in the UK. Uh, and a visiting professor of practice of library science at the University of North Carolina and a MIT Media Lab research affiliate, and I work with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Oh, thank you. We're glad to have you here. Okay. And uh, we have uh, one question. Sure. And the question is, um, what is your vision of a good and resilient digital society? That was his question. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, now that I've answered him, I think I can uh, probably make my answer more crisp oh, because that's good. I've had a, a rehearsal. Answer. So I think that um, anyone who claims to know where the evidence will take us for a good digital society uh, is either lying to themselves or lying to you. Uh, and I think it's much more important to have uh, a process by which we answer that question from moment yeah. to moment yeah. because the answer will change based on lots of other things going on in our world. And so I think the process should be one that is pluralistic and evidence-based. Yeah. And uh, I think no process can be evidence-based unless it's pluralistic. Yeah. Because I think that if you have people who have a lot of power, yeah. that they get to shout down people who are their critics. Yeah. And so we have to have an even footing. And so I think that what we should have is a digital society where when we make democratic decisions, we seek evidence, we have a truth-seeking exercise, and that the participants in that truth-seeking exercise should be all of about the same size. And so we shouldn't have five giant companies. So the first thing we need to do is break the five giant companies up into pieces small enough that when they speak, that it's on the same footing as when we speak. Yeah, that's true. I, I first didn't want to ask another question, question but I do. Um, uh, it's, it's what we also deal uh, with a colloquium. What happens to digital public space? And uh -huh. how, uh, how uh, can we uh, make that to a good way? So it's, it's interesting. You say digital public space. We don't really have any of those, right? We only have private spaces that the public are conditionally welcome in, like Facebook. Um, you know, we don't have parks on the internet. We just have uh, malls. Yeah. Uh, and a mall works well, but it fails badly. Uh, yeah. When I was a yeah. teenager, yeah. Um, across from my school, we had a mall uh, that had gotten a planning variance to mm -hmm. put up a, a giant mall on the corner because mm -hmm. it would serve as a public space. Mm -hmm. It would have a subway station, post office, uh, all of these public services, but it also had private security guards. And yeah. under Canadian law, something called the Trespasser Property Act, they don't have to give you a reason. They can just ask you uh, to leave and never let you uh, back yeah. in. Everyone in my school was barred for life from the mall. Yes. Right? So um, getting back to pluralism, right, there's two ways to address this. They're not exclusive. One is you could have a bunch of private spaces, or public spaces, rather, mm -hmm. so you could have spaces operated by states or state-like entities mm -hmm. that were bound by uh, constitutions and mm -hmm. responsible democratically. And you could also, instead of having one mall that's mm -hmm. the only place to hang yeah. out, you could have a hundred places, in which case, even if one mall didn't want you there, yeah. it'd be very hard for all yeah. 100 of them yeah. to kick you out. So, in fact, that is well what happens with the, the public space. It's not a public space, it's a, it's a, it's a private public space yeah. so so yeah. I, I mean but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that there's more than one kind of private public space mm. a, a private public space where there's only one of them like the yeah. only place to hang out is that yeah. like airports are really good examples yeah. right an airport is most airports are public private spaces mm. uh, and the thing is that if the airport doesn't like you there isn't another airport you can go to fly. <laughs> right so like yeah that, that's gatekeeper right but like restaurant light gatekeeper if, if a restaurant doesn't, you know, if a restaurant says, oh, every time you come in here, you're a terrible tipper, you're not allowed to come in here anymore, mm -hmm. but there's a thousand other restaurants to eat in, doesn't matter as much. Yeah. It still might matter. Maybe they're kicking you out because of the color of your skin right. and they're only saying you're a terrible tipper, right? Um, but, but it doesn't matter as much if there's lots of other places to eat. 
But if McDonald's owns every restaurant in your city yeah. and they tell you you're not welcome anymore, yeah. then that takes on this, this other dimension. And so, you know, our willingness to create a, uh, uh, a monopolized internet has created a, a special set of problems, a new set of problems that are distinct from the problems we used to have with, mm -hmm. with private spaces, yeah. which is the problems of private space under monopoly. Yeah, I, I have been at Bundesrat where there was talking a woman from Facebook and she was saying, yes, this is our house rules. And yeah. that's, uh, the, uh, that's the problem that we have a public space right. uh, in house, uh, under with house, with rules. house rules. So yeah. coming back to the last question is, um, would that be a condition for a good society to have uh, public digital spaces that are not private? So I think that's, um, that's the kind of question that I'd like to see answered by um, evidence mm -hmm. and not a priori. Because I can think of some problems with public spaces that a private space might solve. For example, you might want to have a space for uh, survivors of sexual assault, yeah. where people who advocate for weaker penalties for rapists mm -hmm. aren't welcome. And if you're in a if and if you're in a public space with a strong free speech tradition, right, where the Constitution doesn't allow for exclusion on the basis of, of political belief, then you may not be able to set up that private mm -hmm. that that space. So, I guess what I'm saying is that, at a bare minimum, we should have a plurality of private spaces. Of private and non-private. And and then and then in addition, I think we probably need public spaces too. I mean, I remember when the internet was very, very pluralistic, right? When, when, mo when all of the internet companies were of about the same size, mm -hmm. uh, and they were all pretty small, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of movement. Even if a company got big, it might fold up the next day. You know, Alta Vista, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I think that we did okay with our public spaces because it was so pluralistic, mm -hmm. right? But. Uh, and of course, you know, it ran on publicly funded infrastructure, right? It, it ran on uh, public research and publicly set standards and so on. But the private spaces meant that you could do things you couldn't do in public spaces. So like, um, you know, the, the, before there was the web, there was a thing called Usenet, which was for messages. Mm -hmm. And at first, all of the Usenet hosts were either government agencies, government contractors, or publicly funded universities and they wouldn't allow any discussion of sexuality. So not just pornography, but just like discussions of people's sexual identity, sexual health discussions, and so on. Because they didn't want someone standing up in Congress and saying, why is the taxpayer's dollar going to fund these perverts talking about their weird sex lives on the internet, right? And when private entities joined Usenet, they created a, a second set of Usenet news groups that weren't carried by the public institutions yeah. where people talked about sexuality, yeah. right? And, and so uh, I think that like as, it in, as it, my intuition is that maybe if it were very, very pluralistic mm -hmm. that the public spaces would be redundant, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if that's true. And I think that we could find out, yeah. right? Like we could find out by like first making the internet a lot more pluralistic. Yeah. One thing I think is that if we just made some public spaces but didn't break up concentration in the giants, it wouldn't do us any good. Yeah. Okay, so maybe another another question. Um, do you have a special thoughts on Europe? Or yeah, I mean, just as relates to digital, you know, I think with the copyright directive, Europe covered itself in so much shame. It was so unresponsive to public will and expert opinion and made and, and operated in such bad faith, you know, including the insistence right into the last that filters wouldn't be necessary. And within a week you had the French saying, oh, we're going to have filters. And within a month the Germans had, had said so too, and so did the commissioners, that if you wanted to discredit Europe, you couldn't have done a better job, right? If you wanted to convince people that Europe was the caricature that Euroskeptics have of it, you could not have done a better job. <laughs> okay, so uh, we will leave this as a last, yeah. last statement. Cool. Thank you.